Hey, good morning. Can the person who complained on Reddit about not being able to hear me hear me today with the microphone? I hope so. Um, okay, so we have, this is the end of week three in CS125. And for the next week or so, we have a midterm coming up. Not next week, we have one more quiz, and the week after we have a midterm. But for the next week or so, we're going to kind of slow down the rate at which we introduce new ideas. Until like next Friday when we talk about objects, which will kind of be the start of the next unit in the class. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on using the imperative programming constructs that we've already seen to solve problems. We're gonna give you guys practice sort of in designing algorithms and then implementing those algorithms. So today is not the last time in this class that, you know, we'll have a couple practice problems for you to work on in class. I'll give you a little bit of time as we go along to do that, um, and then we'll go over those solutions together, okay? But first, I, today, I do have a little bit more that we need to talk about, because I need to talk, uh, we need to talk a little bit more about functions. Uh, there's, I, I lied to you about how functions work, and I need to correct that before we can go on, because as we start to look at examples of how to use some of the string methods, the, the the methods that the string class provides, you're gonna see some things that are gonna cause you to realize that I've misled you, so I need to, to fix that. But the first thing I wanna do today is just pause and talk a little bit about sort of where you are in this class. So there's a lot of freshmen in this course, meaning that this has been, you know, your first month in college, not even to the end of a first month. Most of you are smart. I shouldn't say most, all of you are smart. In fact, many of you did really well on everything that you ever did in high school. And so, here you are in CS125, and some of you took quiz two, and you're like, oh my gosh, I've never seen a score like that before. I'm here to tell you that that's okay. I'm also here to tell you that I'm 100% convinced that everybody in this room can succeed in this class. I know you can do it. Will you do it? That's more up to you. We're doing our best in this class to provide you with the resources that you need to succeed. Putting in the time and the effort and the practice, that's up to you. But I know that you can learn this. I wouldn't be teaching this course if I wasn't 100% convinced that I can teach every one of you in this class and the people that are wandering in late as well, computer science. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm doing this. So if you're struggling a little bit right now, if you're worried a little bit, Stay with us. You will be okay as long as you keep doing the work. Do the practice problems. You know, prepare for the quizzes. Do the homeworks that we put out every day. Work on the MPs. Come to office hours. There's no magic about how you succeed in this class. We are here to help. Part of that, that time, the way that we're helping is by helping you actually solve the problems, providing hints on the form or whatever. Sometimes like today and sometimes in labs and when you interact with CAs in office hours, we're also here to help just kind of remind you that it's gonna be okay. If you keep working, if you keep trying, you're gonna get it. Trust me. There is, like I said, I wouldn't teach this class if I wasn't 100% convinced that I can teach everybody here how to do this stuff. You guys have to put in the time and energy. We provide the resources but I know that you can do this. So don't freak out, okay? You're gonna make it. One bad quiz score, you know, one not so great MP score is not gonna do you. That's why we have the dropped grades. It's a long semester. We're just getting started. This is the end of week three, so we've basically done like 20% of the class. There's a lot more that we're gonna do together. And again, I am 100% convinced that the only way you can fail is if you quit. So don't do that. This stuff is too important. It will change your life in too profound a way. Many, some of you will quit and that's okay. You'll, you'll, you'll drop because something else is going on in your life and this isn't the, isn't the right time to learn this material. But for those of you that have the time, that have the energy, please stay with us because again, you will make it to the end. You will do better than you thought in the class. You will be pleased with things and you will have learned an enormous amount, okay? All right, pep talk over. Java method overloading. So when we talked about functions, what I told you is that functions were like variables, where in the same scope, I can't have two functions with the same name. That turns out to be false. I lied to you. I looked up 
for reference, 10 warning signs of a bad professor. So you can, I guess, find this list online. Uh, it's a little bit out of date, this is from 2010. Um, but I was, I was curious, the professor is boring, that may apply to me, I guess that, um, the professor is bummed out. I am not bummed out, okay, so I don't qualify. The professor doesn't give out a syllabus, we do do that. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so I think the professor assigns an undoable amount of work. Yeah, I may be guilty of that sometimes. Um, incredibly petty rules, this check style count here. Um, <laughs> can't fill the entire class period, I am not having a problem with that, okay. Uh, seems I'm sure about the material, no way. I am 100% sure about this. Uh, presents the material in a confused way. Hmm. Uh, if a professor attends only to his or her notes and never even looks at the students. I do try to look at you guys, there's a lot of you. But. Anyway, so I don't think I'm doing, but the professor line is actually not on this list, which is really interesting, you know? Apparently one of the signs of a bad professor is not teaching incorrect material, which is interesting. Maybe I'll try that next semester. All right. So, method overloading. And this is actually a deeper concept that we have time to talk about today, but we'll come back and talk about method overloading when we talk about polymorphism, which is this really cool idea in Java that has really interesting theoretical roots. But today, I just wanna point out that this will work. Okay, so, what happens on lines one through three? I create a function called sum. Returns an int. Okay, so at this point, I have a function called sum. Lines four through seven, sorry, four through six, I create another function called sum. That's weird. And then I'm gonna call those functions. So you might think, huh, what's gonna happen here? Like, maybe the second function declaration overrides the first one. Maybe this is sort of like variables, where I can, re I can take a variable, I can declare it, initialize it, and I can change the value of it. Um, so if you run this code, it will work. And let me show you something interesting. So let's put um, some of our favorite debugging mechanism here. So I'm gonna put a, a print line in there, and then I'll also put it down here. So now I can see. So, so maybe what's happening is just one of those functions is being called, not both. But it turns out that both of them are being called. The int sum gets called on line nine, and then the double sum gets called on line 10. So somehow here in the same piece of code, in the same block of code, Java is able to uh, provide me with two different sum functions of the exact same name. So how does it do this? Okay, and again, this is actually a really powerful, extremely useful idea um, that we're introducing and we'll talk about more when we talk a little bit more about objects. So in Java, this, this is referred to as method overloading. In Java, I can have multiple methods with the same name. As long as Java can distinguish between them when I call them. So how does it do that? So Java doesn't just use the function name when I call a function to figure out which function to run. It also includes the argument types and order and, well, I don't think the return type, just the argument types and order. So together, we call this sometimes a function or a method signature. It's not just the name, the name is part of the signature, but so Java essentially looks for a match between the name of the function and then the types of the arguments that I'm using. So, you know, what in Java is asking when I try to call this function is, can I find a function with the right name? Okay. If step one le yields more than one option, then the way I choose it is by looking at step two. And I say, is the function, based on the call, is the function, does the function have the right uh, argument types? Okay, we'll see an example of this in a second. One of the other things that Java will do that's also a little bit confusing is, if possible, it will also try to convert the argument types for you to find a match, as long as there's no loss of precision. So remember before how I could take a double, and I could initialize it with an int literal, because there's no loss of precision. I can't initialize a double, wait, I can initialize a double with an int, I can't initialize an int with a double, because that would force Java to discard information. We'll see how to do that in a minute, but I can't do that implicitly. So when I call a function, if I call it with ints, and there's a function that takes doubles, 
Java will quietly convert those ints to doubles for me and call the correct function. Again, we'll see this in a minute. All right. So what happens here on line nine is Java says, okay, you're calling a function called sum. Let me look for functions called sum. I found two functions called sum. One was defined on line one, the other one was defined on line five. Okay, how do I pick which one to use? Well, let's look at the arguments that you're providing to sum. You're providing two arguments, and they're both ints. Do I have a function called sum where the function signature matches what you're trying to do? And the answer is yes, I have one on line one. So that's the one that gets used. Same thing happens on line 10. I call sum over here on the right side. I'm providing two doubles. Java says, okay, is there a function called sum? There is. Is there a function called sum that takes two doubles? There is. So that's the one I use. So let's, let's make this not work. So for example, if rather than providing a function called sum that takes two doubles, I call a function called, I create, I change the, the signature of this to be a function called sum that only takes one double. So now what's gonna happen? So the, this error message here, which is not um, super beautiful, but it says, I can't find a method that takes two doubles. That's essentially what this is saying. It said, you, you asked me to call a method called sum that takes two doubles on line 10, but I can't find one like that. I can only find one that takes one double. So if I change my call to take one double, now I'm good. So same thing here. Let's change the type of the second argument. Well, this will actually work. So let's say, let's have it take a Boolean add 10, and we'll say if add 10, Otherwise, I'll just return first. So now I have a method called sum that takes a double in a Boolean. Can I call it with two doubles? No, I can't. There's no, nothing that matches. Can I call it with one double? No. Can I call it with a double and a Boolean? Yes. Okay. So let me show you about that, that third rule, right? So. Remember, Java will, if possible, try to convert the arguments and then use them if there's no loss of precision. So let's say that I don't have a function. Let me go back to what I had here before. Where I had this guy taking two doubles, and it's going to return first. Hold on a second. Okay, great. Let's make, just convince ourselves this works again. Okay. So if I, if I remove the function that takes ints, what's going to happen? Let me comment this guy out. So now I'm only defining a function that takes doubles. Think on this for 10 seconds. What do we think is going to happen? So on line 11, Java's gonna say, okay, do I, do I have a function called sum that takes two integers? Answer is no, I don't. I just commented that one out. Do I have one that, but can I convert those integers in a way that doesn't lose precision and allows me to call the function called sum? The answer is I can. So see what happens? Both of these calls now use the version of sum that takes two doubles. Okay, so, so that's one application of the rule. What happens if I, let's say I comment out the one that takes doubles. If I can remember how to write comments. I think I can today, there we go. What's gonna happen now? So I'm trying to call once with two ints, once with two doubles. The first call will work, the second call will not. Because I can't convert from a double to an int without losing precision, and so Java will not do that. Okay, so those are the rules on method overloading. Why did we do this? Um, I wish I had had this up here. So when you guys start looking at the string documentation, one thing you need to, you're gonna see are cases where um, the same method is provided multiple times. So let's see if I can find one of these. H here's an example. So there are two different methods, content equals. One of them takes something that's a character sequence, the other takes something that's a string buffer. Two identical methods, the Java distinguishes by, by determining what their types are. Same thing with copy value of. 
So there's one version of copy value of that takes a single character array. There's a second version that takes a single character array and then an offset and a number of characters to copy. So this is really common in Java. Other languages have different idioms for doing this. For example, Python has default, uh, Python allows you to set default um, art values for arguments and has both named and positional arguments. In Java, we don't have that. It's a little bit of an older language. Instead, this is how I accomplish it. So you'll see this a lot, where you'll see, you know, a particular um, object or a particular interface provide 10 different methods that all have the same name and are only distinguished by the types that they, they accept. So this is one way to, to provide this kind of uh, flexibility in Java. All right, get out of here, go back. Where were we? Bingo. All right. So let me show you, uh, I'm, I'm about to introduce, you know, another sort of new idea related to imperative programming and to objects. But let me pause, and this is sort of a grab bag day, so we're gonna talk about a couple different things. One of the things that we, you're gonna start, to, we're gonna start to have you do when you write code for the homeworks or for the MPs is validate your inputs. So this is a software engineering pattern that is extremely useful and extremely common. So the idea is that before I start to run a function, before I, the function actually starts to do real work, what it needs to do is figure out whether or not the inputs that you provided to it are okay. You guys did this on MP0, you did it for LCM. Because for example, the LCM of two zeros or the LCM of a zero and any other number is not defined. So the first thing you did before you did any work on LCM, I hope, if you got the question correct, was that you made sure that neither one of your arguments was a zero. If it was a zero, you returned that invalid value that indicated that somebody called you with the wrong number. So frequently what we do is at the top of a function, we think about all the different ways that you could give me bad inputs, and I try to reject all of them. And I just reject them with return statements. We'll talk about different ways to reject bad arguments later in the semester when we talk about errors in Java and exceptions. But for now, you know, it's frequently common to just return a value that indicates that something went wrong, that the caller of the function didn't provide you with good input. So for, so for input sum, let me actually go past this and then we'll come back. Ah, okay, so no. So remember that Java arrays are objects. Java strings are also objects. So now that we've started to work with objects in Java, we need to talk about something called null. Null is a special value in Java that indicates that the particular reference is, points to nothing. And we will talk about references later. It's one of those places in Java where these, there are these circular dependencies, where it's like, to really explain all you have to talk about references, to really understand references, you have to understand objects better, we haven't talked about that. So we'll, we'll come back, and this will, will close some of these loops later. But for now, you're gonna start to see this, some of you have already seen this on MP1. So what is null? Null indicates that there's, that there's no object there. So for example, I can create on line one, what is this doing? This is creating a array of ints called output, in this case, it's initializing it to null. Now, if you don't initialize output, if I just declared it, the initial value of output is null. It's not an empty array. It's a null array, and a null array is very different. So this is the special value in Java that indicates that this particular object has not been initialized. There, there's, there's no object there, essentially. There's nothing. In Python, you have something called none. It's a very similar idea. Some languages have this idea, and some don't. And we'll talk about why in a minute. So null is an invalid object. If you try to access the properties of null, that will cause an error. If you try to call methods on null, that will also cause an error. So if, if someone gives you a null string, or a null object, or a null array, there's really nothing you can do with it. You can't determine how long it is, you can't call any of its methods. All of, any attempt to work with null will fail. So let's, let's show an example of this. So on line one, I'm creating that output array that I talked about before. I'm, an, I'm initializing here explicitly to null. I can't print it, so line two will work. Prints null. 
But if I try to access its length, I get a runtime error. If you run this in IntelliJ, you'll get something called a null pointer exception. So I can't access its length. I can't do anything with it. So for example, this is different than the following. So if I, let's say I create a new empty array, this will work fine. We'll, we're gonna come back and talk about what you're looking at on the first line later in the class. For now, you can just not worry about it. But you'll see that the, the call on line three works. I can access the length of an empty array. An empty array is not a null array. If I don't initialize this guy, what's gonna happen? Well, it's gonna complain that it's uninitialized, but let me initialize it to null, right? So this is a difference between a null array and an empty array. An empty array is a valid Java object that has no members. It's not that useful, but it exists. A null array or a null string is, it's not even there. So let's do this with strings as well. So let's say string output is equal to null. Here I can't, remember this is, this is definitely tripping people up on some of our quizzes. Like I said, if I have an array, length is a property. If I have a string, length is a method. I'm sorry, this is not my fault. Uh, but they are slightly different. I'm gonna get the same error here though. Because I'm trying to call a method on a null object. I can print it, just print null, but I can't call length, I can't call care at zero. No, there's nothing I can do with this object. It doesn't exist. So one of the things I'm gonna teach you to do in this class, and this is something that I will admit is slightly antiquated, is to check things for null. When we give you tests, and this is gonna start now, it's gonna start on the homeworks, it's gonna start on the MPs, we will sometimes, some of those test cases will pass you a null object. So we'll give you a function that takes a string. We'll say reverse the string. We're gonna do that one in a minute. Some of the test cases will pass you a string that's null. So the first thing you need to do in that function is check, make sure that you have a valid string. If you don't, we'll tell you what to do. Now, there has been, so this, so null pointers, null objects in Java, uh, the, one of the designers of the Java language has referred to this as the billion dollar mistake. Because they cause a lot of problems for programmers. There's a bunch of errors and crashes and, you know, programs that didn't quite work properly that have been caused by this problem. And, you know, and, and there are new languages that try to avoid this entirely. So I've been working recently a little bit in a language called Kotlin. That's the language that we use to design the IntelliJ plugin you guys are using this semester. Kotlin has a real focus on avoiding this type of problem. So it has new idioms in the language that force you to be really clear about when you might be working with a null reference. And then there are special safety checks that Kotlin will introduce. For now, I think that this is still a useful thing to do. Particularly given that you're gonna go on and be forced to work in these really old fashioned languages like C++ and C and stuff like that if you go on and take 225 and 241. So I'm gonna continue to teach this. But I just want you to understand that the software design community has been actively trying to address this problem through better language design. There are, there are people that think that an object should never be able to be null because it just causes problems. And all this does is cause crashes and bugs that are really hard to find, I think. But in this class, we're gonna teach you how to be defensive. We're gonna, you know, include tests in our test suites. They're gonna ask you to make sure that you check for null. You'll get used to this. It's actually not that hard to do. All right, last new idea for today before we're done. And then we'll do a couple examples together. All right, so casting. So we've talked a little bit about how Java will, particularly with primitive types, it will convert one type to another for you. In certain cases, if it can do so without losing precision. But what if I want to lose precision? What if I'm okay with that? What if I have a double and I know as a programmer that it's okay to convert this double to an int. Understanding that that's going to cause whatever fractional component that double has to be dropped. Remember, it's not rounded, it's just dropped. If you have 10.99999 and you convert it to an int in Java, what do you get? 10, don't get 11. 
So there's something called a type cast that you can use in Java. You can both use these with primitive types and you can also use these with objects. With objects, what happens is much more interesting than something we'll talk about later. But with primitive types, what happens is fairly simple. This is particularly used with numeric types. So for example, on line one here, I'm creating an int called i, I'm initializing it to 10. On line two, like I said before, I can take an int and use it to initialize a double because there's no loss of precision. On line um, three, with a comment wrap there, I can't assign that double back to i because now it's a double, and so trying to use it to set an int is going to fail because Java's gonna say, I can't do this without potentially losing information. So how do I force it if I really want to? I say, I'm the programmer, I'm in charge, I should be able to use the computer to do anything I want. I use this over here. So this is what's called a cast. It's the type enclosed in parentheses, and it tells Java, I really want you to convert this to an int. I'm okay with the fact that you might lose some information. I'm taking responsibility for that as a programmer. I'm forcing you to do it. This is a type cast. So let's do this example again. Line three is not going to work. So if I try running this, it says assignment conversion not possible from type double to type, that's on line three. But if I comment out line three, and then let's just print I at the end, I'm good. I can also do the same thing with, um, with floats. Right, I mean, frequently, probably the most common place you see typecasts like this is from floating point types in Java to integers. And, well, really from floats to integers. Java will convert integers to floats for you. Another place where you might have to do this, though, let's do another example that's a little bit uh, more interesting. So, let's use longs. So remember, in, in Java, an integer stores an integer value and has a particular range. A long stores an integer value but has more, it can store more numbers than an integer. It's bigger, it takes up more space in memory. So I can convert a long to an integer, but you'll see the same problem here on line three when I don't have a cast. So why can't I do this? Why can't I take a long and use it to set an integer. With floating point types, it's sort of obvious. There was like that floating point part that I had to throw out, but why can't I do this? Why is this not safe? Yeah. Yeah, so if I have a huge integer, like massive, and I convert it to an int, it's possible that I am gonna lose data. Ints are smaller. It's take up less room in memory. So if I have an enormous number and I try to convert it to an int, it's possible that Java will not be able to do that without losing information. So it will not do that conversion on line three. However, I can force it using the same idea as before. So I can say, I'm so confused today. All right, let's try this again. This is not going to work. Ah! Thank you. See, even I struggle with this stuff sometimes in front of 800 of you. It's embarrassing. Okay, bingo. Phew, thank you. Yeah. So I'm forcing Java to treat it as an int. Yeah. Some part of it is is gone, and the, and the, the, to be honest, I don't remember exactly which part Java throws away. Well, let's try it actually. Not not with longs; they're too big. Let's try using a byte. So let's say I create a well. Let's use a a short, and let's initialize it to ten twenty four. And then let's take a byte. Okay, bytes are smaller than shorts. I'm gonna cast this like that. Da, 
that's going to work. What did I lose? Huh. That's interesting. I think what happens here, and this goes back to the, and it's not something I want to go over for in, in a lot of detail, but if you guys remember back to the first lab we did on binary. So in computer memory, that short is represented as a series of six ones and zeros. When you convert it to a byte, I have to be able to now represent it with eight ones and zeros. What does Java do? I think it just tosses the top eight. So the most significant eight bits get thrown out. Let me test my hypothesis. Yeah. So 1024 happens to be a power of two. If you look at how 1024 is represented in binary, it's a one followed by a bunch of zeros, but that one is in the top eight bits. So when I lose those top eight bits, I'm left with just a bunch of zeros. If I use 1025, the way the number is represented in binary is a one followed by a bunch of zeros followed by one one at the very end. So when I lose the top eight bits, I'm left with one. Yeah, so this is almost like modular arithmetic, actually. Good question. Other questions about this before we do some problems? All right, perfect. So we have 20 minutes to, to work on a couple problems together. Fantastic. Okay, so problem number one. Given a string, reverse it. Return a new string, which I always have to do, that is the original string in reverse order. So I can think of at least three ways to approach this problem. Um, I'm gonna give you guys, let's see, three minutes to work on this at your seats. If you finish, feel free to help your neighbor. Uh, when that time is up, we will talk about the problem together. Well, actually, sorry. I'm out of practice at doing this. So let's talk about the algorithm here, and then I'll let you guys implement it. So in order to reverse the string, I need to treat it as, as a bunch of characters. I had a couple of different ways of doing that. And I'm gonna, I have the string document, documentation up for you guys to look at. There was a method in the string that would convert it to an array of characters. There's also a method on the string object that allows me to examine every character in the string by index. We used those in the past. So I'm gonna go through every character in the string in some order. Maybe I go back to front, maybe I go front to back. And I'm going to, as I'm going, what I'm going to be doing is assembling a new string. So I need to go through every character in the original string, and I need to figure out where should it go in the new string and put it there. And again, there's a couple of, there are probably like, actually now that I think about it, six or nine different permutations of how to do this problem, depending on which loop order you use, depending on whether you build a new string from scratch or convert it to a character array. So I suspect that several of you will come up with different ways of doing this, and we'll go through a couple of them together. Okay, so you have four minutes till 9.38. Take a stab at this. Like I said, when you finish, talk to somebody next to you, talk to your neighbor, try to come up with some test cases for your reverse function to make sure it works, and then we'll go over it together. In case it helps, I put the string documentation on the next page. So you can also find it online.
right, you guys have about a minute left. If you're done, try doing it a different way. While you guys are wrapping up, let me uh, just make a public service announcement here based on the uh, audio I'm getting here in the room. If you have like bronchitis or something, um, please don't come to class. Um, you know, this is, no, I'm, I'm totally serious about this. So there's, there are like 800 people in here. Um, this is a great way to spread disease and illness through campus. Um, we will, we're, we're working on getting the lecture videos online. I think that will start to happen regularly in the next week or so, but you know, we're entering into cold and flu season, so I'm, I'm really begging you, like, you know, I, I don't want there to be an article in the Daily Illini about how CS125 has infected the entire campus with, like, some sort of communicable disease or something like that. So, um, just, you know, take a day off if, if you're really, if you're really not feeling well. Okay, let's, let's do this one. So, what's, what's one way to approach the problem? Like I said, there were at least, I, I could think of at least three different ways to do this. But let's, let's do, let's do one of them. So, remember I had, I had this ability to concatenate strings. So Java provides me with a nice string concatenation operator. And so in this case, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna start with an empty string. And I'm going to append characters from the input string to it one at a time until I'm done, at which point I'll have the input string in reverse order. To do this, what direction do I have to go through the input string? Well, let's try going in the forward direction. So let's say i is equal to zero, i is less than input dot length, i is plus plus. Let's do return to string equals Turn string plus input dot care at i. And then we'll do return, return string. Oops, from on out dot println reverse cs25, right? So I've got the same string. So that doesn't work. But I can make a small change to this so that it will work. What do I do? So I've successfully rebuilt the same string. So that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to rebuild it in reverse order. Yeah, so I, I want to do my reverse loop. This is a case where I want to write that canonical backwards loop. So instead of going through the input in forward order, I'm gonna go in reverse order. All right, boom, work. Try, you know, I always wanna try a couple different inputs. Um, try that, all right, that looks right to me. Um, okay, who did it in a different way? Yeah. You can't. So every time that line runs, there's a new string that's being created. That's equal to the previous string plus that value. Yeah, so internally, Java is keeping multiple copies of this. From your perspective as a programmer, it doesn't matter. I can actually make this a little bit cleaner too. Instead of doing turn string plus, let's do plus equals. That will still work. Good question. Other questions? So let's do this in a way that will be a little bit more helpful for your homework problem today. So I can also treat it as an array of characters. And what I'll do here is I'll create a new array of characters that's the same size as the string, and I'll go through the string in forward order, and I'll figure out where the new character is supposed to go in the reverse string, and then I'll put it there. All right, so in this case, I'm gonna have a forward loop, so I'm gonna write that first. So this is just my canonical forward loop. Up here, what do I need? So I need a, a character array. So I know how to in initialize a character array. 
One of the things I'm trying to show you by doing these examples is, is what I consider to be good variable naming conventions. So I like to call a variable that I'm gonna return a name that starts with return. You can't call it return, because otherwise Java would get confused and think it's a return statement, but you can call it return string, return int, return array, whatever, right? That helps me remember what I'm doing with this variable. If my return statement at the bottom doesn't return that variable or some, you know, uh, a function that's related to it, then, then I'm confused, right? So it'll also help people that read your code figure out what's going on. So I'm creating a new character array. How large is this character array going to be? How many, how many values do I need it to store? Input dot length. It needs to be the same size as the input. All right. So now I'm going through the input one at a time. So let's just print off I. Method must return a value. Okay, fine. Okay, so I, I know I'm going through each index. Where does that character go? Let's try to figure that out in the reversed string. So I'm gonna say reversed position. I'm gonna create an int, another int here. And that's a function of i. So i starts at the beginning. Where should the, where should the reverse position start? At the end, what's the last valid index of that array? Input dot length minus i because it's gonna start at the end and move this way. We're close. What should, the, so, so this is a way to get, to help yourself get this right. What should this value be when i is zero? In this case, it looks like, let's do one that's shorter. It's easier to think about, so we'll do CS125 again. How many letters does that have? Five. What's the last valid index in the array? Four. When i is zero, reverse position should be the last position, what's input dot length minus i? Five. So I've gotta scoot this one over by one. So now let's print this and we'll print the reversed position. Oh, sorry. I am forgetting how Java works, all right. Okay, so now I'm printing both counters. I see I have one that starts at zero that goes to four. I have another one that starts at four and goes down to zero. Right? Okay, so now what do I do? So now I've got the right indices. And again, this is how you build these implementations up, step by step. So I know I've got i, which is where the character is coming from in my original string. And I have a position in the reverse string. So how do I do this? So I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the, the value, I'm gonna say return array, I need to copy that character into the array that I'm gonna return. So I say return array reversed position is equal to, and here, this is one of those places where, you know, if you didn't remember this, you can consult the documentation. I do remember it. This is one of the, the useful methods that strings have. So input dot care at i. So what does that line do? That line says, take the input character at position i and copy it into my return array at position reverse position. So now I'm swapping things. I'm taking the character from position four, sorry, I'm taking the character from position zero in the string and I'm moving it to position four in the reverse array. And then I go from one to three. And then I go from two to two. And then I go from three to one, four to zero. So I've swapped everything. Now, if I try to return this array directly, what's gonna happen? Which we can try it. What do you think's gonna happen? What's the type of return array? It's an array of characters. What's the return type of reverse? String, so I need a way to convert this uh, array of characters into a string. The way you do that is you, one of the ways to create a string is using new, as we showed before, and one of the string constructors takes an array of characters as an argument. So if I have an array of characters and I want to create a string, I can do this. There it is. Same thing, done differently. There was one more way to do this. I won't go over it. 
it's essentially kind of a, a small modification on this that involves swapping the two characters rather than building a new array, right? But this is, you know, how I want you to approach these kinds of problems. Once you have a working solution as well, you know, go through and like try to tighten it up. Our goal in this class is to teach you how to build beautiful, perfect code. We're not asking you to write thousands of lines of code, we're asking you to write 10 lines, but I want them to be perfect. And later in the semester, we're gonna have you start evaluating aspects of clarity and conciseness by looking at each other's code as part of an assessment. So, in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good, but what I would probably do here is I would probably just move this in here. Because now I know I'm doing the right thing. Get rid of this extra variable. Done. This is good. I like this. This is concise. You know, it's elegant. It works. Questions about this? We'll come back on Monday and do more things like this for the next week, partly to prepare you for the upcoming midterm. Questions about this before we go? Yeah. So if I wanted to print the result, I could do that, right? But I want to return a new string. So the, so, so that's a great question. So the question was, could I just print the values of the array in reverse order? If I wanted to print a reverse string, I could do that. But this function wants to return a reverse string. So it was basically what we did the first time, right? We went through the array in reverse order and we added all the elements of the string and then returned the string, right? But yeah, if I was printing, I could certainly do that. I could just use print, print the characters in the reverse order, and I'd be done. Okay, so we'll do this other example on Monday. Um, let me uh, make a couple of announcements here. So we have office hours for MP1 that continue today. Um, the weekend.